Hello and thanks for joining us on Team Reptile Adventures. Although Amy and I spend much of our free time doing Team Reptile, we both really enjoy taking vacations. I absolutely love to spend time in the northern parts of Michigan and so does Amy. The funny thing about our vacations, however, is they often end up being very similar to Team Reptile Adventures. That was the case with our trip to Utah where we ended up checking out some buffalo, our trip to Colorado we ended up chasing some elk, and even our honeymoon in Costa Rica we ended up catching a crocodile. Well that leads me to a couple trips we took recently up north where we ended up having some very unexpected yet very exciting adventures. It began with a drive to the Upper Peninsula for us to do some rock hunting which is something else that Amy and I really enjoy. As we drove along the northeastern shoreline of Lake Superior we happened to notice a small pond in a secluded area that was just off the road. We decided to check it out, especially after we had both spotted a couple of painted turtles that were basking on logs out in the middle. Of course, I never go anywhere without a net, even if it's just a small one. We had also packed away a couple of small cameras and Team Reptile shirts because we've learned from experience it never hurts to at least have them with us in case we do see something cool. As I walked along the edge of this pond, I saw a number of frogs hopping in. I was pretty sure that at least a couple of these had been a certain species that we had searched for on a previous Team Reptile adventure in the Upper Peninsula, but we were never able to find them. Holy cow! I had caught this species of frog in the UP before, but had never been able to catch one when we had a camera with us. Yep. This is a mink frog. I know it's too stuffed up. The reason I'm smelling this frog is because mink frogs actually produce kind of a musky odor and from the looks of his toes he's definitely a mink frog because the webbing on the toes will actually go, it, it'll cover all five toes where on the green frog they usually have one toe that won't have the webbing. And the spots kind of give me an idea too that it's a mink frog. Plus I know that the UP has a lot of mink frogs, they also have green frogs but it's uh, we don't generally have mink frogs down in the uh, the lower peninsula, although we have found a couple in Sheboygan, the northern parts, but they're not as populated as the green frog is down there. We're up here, we believe, uh, according to things that we've read and also from what we've seen up here, that there's just as many mink frogs, if not more, than green frogs, although green frogs, I'm sure, are probably thriving up here, especially when we have some of the warmer summers, and they actually do fairly well during the, the winter, too as long as they have some permanent water areas where they're able to hibernate or remain dormant for the, the cold months. But this little fella here is definitely a juvenile. I'm guessing uh, that up here probably mink frogs. We're at the northern part of uh, the eastern part of the UP or close to the, the most, most northern parts. And so generally the green frogs, mink frogs, even bullfrogs that are up here are going to tend to remain as a tadpole probably at least two years I'm guessing so I would say this guy's probably been transformed probably last summer I would say or end of the summer so he's probably about three years old four years old at best he's very small still and they get about as big as a green frog uh, the largest green frogs the mink frogs can get fairly close to that although on average they remain a little bit smaller than most of the the average size green frogs
Although mink frogs look very similar to green frogs, there are some key differences. For one thing, the eyes of a mink frog are usually more prominent, or as what we called it, they bug out more than those of a green frog. They also lack the full ridge called the dorsal lateral ridge that runs along the back of a green frog. Another difference to look for, very carefully of course, is in the webbing on the hind foot's toes. This is a characteristic that I looked for to be sure that this was a mink frog. The webbing on the mink frog's hind foot extends out to the tip of its outermost toe, however the webbing does not extend that far out on the green frog's hind foot. The last physical characteristic to look at is in the legs. Check his legs for the stripes. Yep, there's those horizontal stripes. Whoa, big fella. Let's see the, the stripes. The mink frog usually has spots or stripes along its hind legs, while the green frog's hind legs usually has dark bands that encircle them. I had been holding this mink frog for quite a while now and I could tell he was starting to dry out, so we decided we better get him back down in the water. Go the other way. Go back in the water. After we let the mink frog go, I searched the area some more, hoping to find a larger specimen of the same species. I wasn't having any more luck around the edge of the pond, and I had been reminded of how long of a walk home it would be if I got too dirty, so I decided to end my search. We left the pond area and made our way over to our rock hunting destination, which was Point Iroquois Lighthouse in Brimley, Michigan. By the time we had gotten there, the weather had started to get pretty gloomy. It was only mid-May, so we knew it would still be cold, but we had at least hoped for some sunshine while we were hunting for rocks down on Lake Superior. We went ahead and set up our blind and began to hunt banded agates and other rocks. Okay, so obviously we knew that sitting in a blind was not the way to hunt agates, but we had joked about it with some friends before and decided to do it to see how other rock hunters would respond. No one ended up seeing anything to us, but we sure got some funny looks. We spent some time hunting for rocks, but both of us were getting pretty cold and we hadn't found any agates. We decided to call in an early day and head back to Mackinac City where we were staying. As we were driving back, we were fortunate enough to have our second great find of the trip, a black bear. Although many people in Michigan, especially in the north, have seen black bear in the wild, Amy and I never had. We've definitely tried, but just never seemed to be in the right place at the right time. At first, this young black bear did not seem to care too much that we were there. We had seen the bear while we were driving and just simply pulled off to watch it while it foraged for food in the grass and leaves. Although some people think of bears as carnivores, they are definitely omnivores and they feed on a number of different types of berries, fruits, and plants. They definitely do eat meat, but because their body is not really designed to chase down large prey, they get most of their meat from smaller animals like rodents. They're also a big fan of eating insects, especially ants. We got to watch this bear for a while, but as other cars began to stop to see what we were looking at, the bear decided to retreat to the safety of the woods. Our second series of unexpected events actually happened in August of the same year when we went up to visit my dad in Sheboygan, Michigan. There's a spot in the Sheboygan area along the Black River that we really like to stop at because we often see wildlife there. Well, as luck would have it, this spot definitely provided us with some excitement during the couple days of our trip here. Amy and I just stopped alongside of the road here and we found a very unique species of snake. And what's really neat to me about this is I have only found one of these in my life. And it was actually down in the Oakland County area within Springfield Township. And I know they're in the state. I'm always hoping to find them, always talking about them. And they're called the Northern Ringneck Snake because of this ring around their neck. I'm trying to get it to relax. Right now it still probably thinks it's been picked up by a predator. And obviously I'm not out to hurt it. Just a beautiful snake though. If I can get it to relax a little bit, I want to show the uh, ventral side, the underneath, show the coloration because these are beautiful snakes. Well, it actually tried to bite me. Which, not that it could actually hurt me, although it's neat because in the back of their mouth they actually have a row of teeth that do have some, uh, um, what's called a, uh, a modified saliva. And it's, it's like a venom, but it's basically meant for small animals. There's obviously no way this one can hurt me, even if it bit me. Um, but it was kind of funny because this little guy just opened up his mouth. Oh, look at that. It likes the camera. But look at that beautiful coloration underneath. Of course, it doesn't want to let us see right now. But it's a beautiful, just light color. 
basically matches or is, it's very closely matches the color of the ring around their neck. The snake is finally starting to relax in my hand. Realizes I'm his buddy. One of the funniest parts about finding the snake is when Amy and I parked, we just came out actually just to see what we could find here. When it gets dark, shine a little bit. Uh, probably not the smartest thing to do since there's a lot of bear in the even say mountain lion right in this little area that we're in, but you know, I like to look for animals. So, but one of the funniest parts when we found the snake was got out of the car and I honestly thought that we were finding a dead snake. It had flattened itself out on the road here. Uh, it looked like it had been ran over by a car. I mean, from the head down to the tail, it looked really flat on the road. And actually, it was fine. I went to, uh, to kind of poke at it with something because I realized it was a ring neck after I saw the ring around the neck. Imagine that. But after I uh, saw what it was, I went to poke at it because I thought it was dead. And as soon as I poked at it, it basically inflated itself back up and uh, ended up starting to move. So it, it has a couple little nicks on it, but not from a not from a car. It's probably scraped against something. Could even be, uh, judging by the coloration of the, the body right now, it may be uh, getting close to the time it's going to shed. Because the more I look at it, the more I notice that there's quite a few areas where there's a little darker coloration underneath. And when they shed, their coloration is much more vibrant after they after they go through the full shed. They'll shed from the literally the, the tip of their snout all the way down to the end of the tail, or up against rocks, things like that to take it off. So it's very possible that it still has some skin on or that it's going to shed within the next week or so, which means that it's healthy. So that would be great if it does shed because that tells us that the snake is doing very well. One of the reasons we're finding this snake right now is because it's a nocturnal snake. Most people in Michigan have never seen this snake and have no idea it exists. And this is actually a full grown adult. This is a, a, a large or fairly large snake for or fairly, lies, fairly large size snake for this species. But they're primarily nocturnal. They will come out sometimes on a humid, humid day when it's been rainy or kind of gloomy, and right now it's it's definitely not dark yet, but it has been an overcast day. There's been some rain. They tend to eat worms, uh, redback salamanders. Sometimes they'll even eat smaller snake species, such as the brown snake and the northern red belly snake, which we've found both of those snakes up in this area quite often. In fact, we found a northern brown snake literally about 100 feet from here and uh, underneath a log, so... It's no surprise to me that there are ringneck snakes right here. With the hardwoods forest we have right here too, it means there's probably a very healthy population of redback salamanders. And since these snakes love to eat redback salamanders, it's another reason why it's probably right in this little area here. Now the sad part for this snake is it has a lot of predators. And since we are up in the northern regions here of the lower peninsula, that means it has even more predators to deal with and we're definitely out in an area where there's not a lot of people and which means usually when there's less people that means there's more predators. After we checked out this colorful snake a little while longer I went ahead and took it down to an area that had good cover so I could let it go. We searched around the river for some more wildlife but weren't having any luck so we decided to call it a night. We had already decided before we left though that we were definitely coming back here to search again in the same area the next night. The next day Amy and I decided to take a walk in the afternoon just down my dad's road. We often see a decent number of animals along the route so we decided to bring a camera. Thank goodness we did because otherwise we would have missed out on this professional turkey calling by Amy. As we walked further along the road, we came upon some cows. Now we see these cows every time we walk or drive down this road, but we've never seen them grouped together like this. The further we walked, the more they would adjust to face us. We did find out later from my dad that a mountain lion had been spotted in the field across from the cows two different times earlier this week. We weren't sure if that had anything to do with the cow's behavior today, but it definitely seemed a possibility since there were a couple calves present. We decided to quit playing stare down with the cows and started making our way back to my dad's house. On our way back we found one of the animals that I had really hoped to see while we were out here and that was an adult leopard frog. Since a leopard frog, they're, well all frogs, base everything or base their movements on movement. 
and right now it thinks it's camouflaged, which it is. It's camouflaged really well into the dirt and to the grass right now. And as long as I move very slowly, I can probably catch it. Because all their vision is based on movement. But if I walk over very slowly, start out slow, try to get them to go up toward the road, I'm better off that way. And she knows the road's there. Oh, sometimes I lose them, like that time I couldn't see him. Because he blend the, the leopard spots with the green and the brown and everything, he just blends in so well with the surroundings here. Catching this frog ended up taking a lot more time and being a lot more work than I had anticipated. For quite a while I was outsmarted, outmaneuvered, and plain old just not quick enough. In the end, however, this big goofy mammal was finally victorious over the much smaller amphibian. Got him. I got you. <laughs> this is the northern leopard frog. Definitely an adult, probably four or five years old at least. One of the ways to tell it's a leopard frog is actually very obvious, and that's just the spots on it. But there's also a pickerel frog we have here in Michigan that generally has two rows of more rectangular spots, and they will have a brighter, um, brighter or darker, but more yellow basically on the bottom, where this one has a little bit of yellow here underneath the belly, but uh, primarily it's green and bronze color, and the the spots on it are. A, a more of a round pattern. It's just a beautiful frog though. I like how it has the gold right above the eyes. Within about two weeks to a month, maybe even a month and a half, depending on the, uh, the weather and uh, even the, the climatic conditions with how cold it gets, how fast it gets cold, how much rain we get, uh, this frog will start moving back to the water. What's really neat about leopard frogs is they'll They'll generally spend a lot of time around ponds, rivers, streams, even lakes uh, during the spring, for mating season especially during the spring, and then also within the late summer to fall before hibernation. But during the summer, they'll spend more time in fields, taller grass where they really blend in, and they'll rely on getting their moisture from the morning dew, from rain, uh, getting even into a wooded area sometimes where there's a little more moisture retaining. Although generally you're going to find them more out in the open fields, things like that. Because for one thing, in the wooded areas the predators tend to hide out a little bit more. So they actually are better off in an open field where predators aren't necessarily going to be out during the day and everything, especially around human habitat. With our froggy friend now camouflaged so well down in the vegetation, Amy and I went ahead and left to finish our walk. Within just a few hours, we were back out exploring the area of the Black River where we had found the adult ringneck snake the night before. Little did we know that we were going to have a night that we would not soon forget. Little baby ringneck. That's sweet. That is a juvenile ringneck, and probably less than a year old, is my guesstimate. And uh, that's neat to see because we just found a ringneck last night on the other side of the river, and it was crawling around after it rained. And these actually hatch from eggs rather than uh, live birth, like the garter snakes, and, and actually many of the snakes we have in Michigan. But uh, the ringnecks will hatch from an egg and which for one thing means that a lot of times they're going to be less common and the reason for that is because eggs get dug up by uh, predators a lot of predators possums raccoons there's a number of different animals that actually dig up eggs they can smell them dig them up eat them well a garter snake a female garter snake if it stays burrowed under something a lot of mosquitoes out here if it stays burrowed under something then it has a better chance of keeping the young safe within it. Instead of burying eggs that can be sniffed up and torn apart, the garter snakes and, and many snakes, water snakes, even the Massasauga, many of the snakes that give live birth, they can actually 
like I said, they'll, they'll get underneath things, they'll stay hidden during much of their pregnancy except when they need to eat. And that means that there's a better chance to protect those young there. And when they're ready to have the birth, then they actually will give live birth, real thin membrane, keeps the snakes inside, protects them a little bit as soon as that membrane comes out, the snakes start wriggling right away, and then slither away. And the female ringneck snake does not stay with stay with the eggs. So the eggs are left unattended and just hopes that they hatch. I went ahead and put the snake back where I had found it and began searching again. While I was exploring, Amy spotted an adult water snake with its head and neck protruding from the rocks in the river below. That tongue just came out. I was really nervous about doing anything that might harm the snake, so we decided to leave it alone. He went down in that hole. <laughs> That's wild. And I don't want to hurt him. Right. Within a few minutes, though, I discovered another water snake in a place where I definitely wouldn't have expected to find one. Pretty sure it's northern. Oh, he's going through shedding. Hi, little fella. There you go. Oh, that's all right. Oh. He can't really hurt me, but I don't want him to hurt his jaws either on me. Come here. I know you're going to bite me. Come around. Come around. That's all right. Got my finger a little, a couple times. No big deal, as long as I can get his head. There we go. That'll keep him from getting hurt too. Although, <laughs> it's a good thing he's not venomous because you can tell by the way I'm holding him. I'm not really protecting myself so much and... Woo, he's stinky, isn't he? He's about to rub his vent all over me. Which has very smelly stuff on it right now. And I don't want that to happen. But it's already starting to happen. But this little northern water snake right here is actually ready to shed. And you can tell that because of the blue coloration on his eye. I'm trying to get this out of the way. It's alright buddy. It's alright. It's alright. Not gonna hurt you. Not gonna hurt you. Relax. Northern water snakes are actually born live just like garter snakes and many of the snakes in the typical snake family here in the northern regions of the United States, especially here in Michigan. We see it quite often in the species of snakes we have. And unlike the ringneck snake, they are, as I stated, born live. They come out in a jelly-like sack and begin wriggling right away. Where the ringneck snake and milk snake, a couple other species of snakes in Michigan, the racer, many of those snakes actually are born from an egg and have to break free from the egg. Now what will happen when this one decides to shed, it will start to rub against a rock or against some type of surface like that. And they will shed literally from their snout from the nostrils there and their eyes, that material will come off also all the way down to the tip of their tail and their color will be much brighter once they've shed this skin. We went ahead and put the water snake back where we found it, also making sure to replace the dirt and liner that I had dug up while I had tried to catch the snake. Come back in there buddy. After that we crossed the river to search which is where I had one of the most exciting finds of my life. Ha! Oh you're not going to believe this. It's one of the lizards. I gotta be able to get to him, but it's one of the lizards. Oh crap, he's going too far under. There he goes. Come here. Oh, I can't believe it. I need something to put him in though. <laughs> that is so cool. Oh, I'm so excited. My whole life, my whole life, I've talked about the five line skink. I wanted to find the five line skink. And guess what I just found? The five line skink. It's not Michigan's only lizard because there's also a six line race runner, but it is the most common lizard. And it's the only lizard of this area. And uh, the only lizard that lives throughout Michigan. The six line race runner is a very isolated population near the thumb. And uh, this is a juvenile 
only lizard I've ever found in my entire life in Michigan. Seen a few, but only one I've ever found. And it looks like a garter snake with legs with a blue tail. Whoa! And they're very quick. <laughs> See if we can get them to slow down. It's all right, buddy. It's all right. Fortunately for me, I'm much quicker than him right now because he's so small. He's probably not even a year old. I was really concerned about keeping this lizard safe and I knew if I picked it up in my hands again, I could easily pinch him and damage his body or extremities. I decided instead to get one of the buckets we had brought along with us and try to guide him into it. Thank goodness I had gotten all that practice earlier with the leopard frog just to prepare me for this chase tonight. <laughs> He's probably not even a year old. He probably hatched from an egg. Could have been within the last month or two for all I know. Because I don't have a lot of experience with the, the five line skink, I, I don't know everything about it unfortunately. But obviously this is a great experience for me. Hopefully I can learn a lot. Definitely know it's a juvenile. It's much smaller than what I expected. Much smaller. Got to catch my breath. I am so excited about this because like I said, it's something my whole life I've searched for and I've never found one. They are so quick. When we've seen some of the adults, which are usually anywhere to half a foot, maybe even a little longer than that, they just, they're so quick. And they're, they're not, uh, they don't usually come around humans all the time. They try to avoid them. They have a great sense of smell. And they generally hide underneath things like this one was. And I just happened to lift it up and see the blue tail and thought, you know, there's nothing else in Michigan that I know of that would have that coloration of a tail. The reason they're called a five line skink has to do with those five lines on it. He is definitely a juvenile. One of the ways you can tell he's a juvenile is because of that beautiful blue tail. They love to eat insects. They love little pill bugs, crickets, and they are what is considered an insectivore. And that means that they eat insects, just like the word says. He's got the strangest looking little feet. I sound like I'm echoing, which is probably not good to him. He's probably getting scared. But he's got the strangest little front toes. They almost look like suction pads. Probably helps him to stick to things right now. Especially being lighter weight. But I know as he gets larger, it'll be more claws. The excitement of this find had definitely taken my breath away, and it also made for a great conclusion to our series of unexpected adventures. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you again on Team Reptile Adventures. <laughs>